Well, let's go back now to our subject, the Old Testament is about you. And this evening, I want to take that, our exploration, toward a question that was asked recently, and that is, do liturgical services, such as the Orthodox Christian Divine Liturgy, constitute vain repetition, which Christ spoke against? Well, let's take a look back at the Old Testament again, at the Hebrew Scripture, and see what happened when Moses and the Hebrews came to the Mount of Sinai. Of course, we know the story about God giving the Ten Commandments, and we know that when Moses came back down from the mount of, from the peak of the mountain, with the Ten Commandments, he found the Israelites worshiping the golden calf, and of course broke the Ten Commandments and put a stop to the uh, idolatry. And then God commanded Moses to do something rather interesting to build a church, a church building, a temple in the wilderness, one that was portable and could be carried with the people wherever they went, a prototype of the temple which should be built in the fullness of time. Now there are certain interesting aspects to that temple. First of all, the structure was iconographic, divided into three parts as it was. The Holy of Holies walled off was a type of paradise where God fellowship face to face with Adam and Eve. And it was in that enclosure, that closed off type of paradise, where God said he would be faithful uh, to be there, present, on the mercy seat, to fellowship with people, to come into contact and communion with his people on the mercy seat, in the Holy of Holies, that is, in that type and revelation of paradise. Why were such careful liturgical rules given to Moses, the structure of the, of the tabernacle, that every wall should be covered with icons, the structure of the sacrifices, and why indeed the sacrifices, when later it, it, through the prophets uh, God would tell us that he did, did not desire the, 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 the flesh of bulls and cattle and things, but that he desired that we should have mercy. Well, obviously, the people had a need for something. The temple, the sacrifices, were most certainly not ordained for God's sake, or because God needed or desired anything, but because the people needed something. They needed, first of all, the tabernacle as a focus to keep their focus on their return to paradise, the Holy of Holies. And through these stages that were put in the first two parts of the temple, the offering of incense, the offering of the sacrifices of animals, there was a revelation to the people, but also a condescension to the people. Because the offering of such sacrifices was clearly something that was universal in the ancient world. And something that once the people had fallen to the golden calf, well, it's obvious that they needed something visible and some means of worshiping. So God did give them very careful liturgical order, the ordination of priests. The book of Leviticus tells us how priests were to be inducted into the priesthood, what vestments they were to wear, how they were precisely how they were to prepare sacrifices, what they were to do with everything that was left, all these fine details. Well, partly the fine details were given because people would become careless if, if they didn't have those fine details to follow. And secondly, because there had to be a very clear focus on something. And really the sacrifices served some psychological purpose for the people. They were not something God needed or desired, but the people had a psychological need for all these things and a kind of a spiritual need for it because their spiritual life was still immature, childish, simple, um, confused, and perhaps chaotic. So first thing was to stop the chaos and to give a fixed order. And 
also to provide something that would keep the people from being lured into the idolatry around them. And so some of the same kinds of things were done in the tabernacle that might have been done in some of the idolatrous religions because the people had a psychological need for it at the time. And we still understand the three divisions of the tabernacle and the temple and the Orthodox Church as purification, illumination, and glorification. And throughout the Old Testament, the process of illumination was taking place as people could bear it. And the prophets, as we uh, see, really set up sometimes an internal contradiction against the law. And so did Jesus Christ, in fact, about some interpretations and understandings of the law, to try to bring people to a more full and complete understanding of their relationship with God as a spousal relationship and not a legal agreement. Well, liturgical worship is something that is given to mankind because ultimately we do need it. People who decry the ritual of the liturgy nevertheless have lives filled with ritual. If one would sit down and assess one's life, one would see all the rituals that one creates in life in order to take the chaos out of it and in order to give some kind of stability. So we have stability in our worship and a lack of chaos in our worship. Uh, the other night I was speaking at a university in Washington, in Washington State and uh, I was asked to watch a teleprogram a broadcast from Orlando, Florida, 24 hours of the most incredible preaching you ever would have witnessed. Uh, even the gong show looked serious-minded by comparison. And I ended up thinking that these televangelists were actually parodying Christianity, that they were actually somehow demonic parodies of Christianity, something to undermine, ultimately, people's capacity to take Christianity seriously, because these people were even comedians uh, of the worst kind. Uh, in any case, each one of them would have different doctrines to teach. And one reason why there is chaos and confusion in the non-liturgical Christian world, it's over a thousand different denominations, of Protestantism, for example, is because there's no liturgical anchor that keeps people's focus and which keeps their proper understanding of the true doctrine of salvation, the relationship of the community, and our relationship with Jesus Christ is not kept in any kind of clear form. We have some Protestant denominations that deny the divinity of Jesus Christ, for example, and yet they're Protestant denominations. So we need to understand what the liturgy is and why God gave a liturgy in the Old Testament and told us to worship him in divine liturgy, to teach by reading the scripture and preaching sermons. But the liturgy itself imparts to us a very profound awareness, knowledge, and understanding of our relationship with Jesus Christ, with each other, with mankind, and what our life is really all about, the journey back to paradise. So, uh, no, the liturgy is not some kind of vain repetition because it repeats things. Now, I don't have time, in, in the time left, to discuss neuroplasticity and how the Divine Liturgy uses neuroplasticity in order to inform uh, the way we think and to help reshape the way we think and to re help reshape our visions and understanding of the world and our relationships with man. I only want to say that we do not see the transformation we should see among all Orthodox Christians because they're not taught to understand what the Divine Liturgy is supposed to be teaching them. It's very often left to some kind of remote mysticism. The priest does some stuff in the altar and comes out and gives us communion. The choir sings a nice, some nice songs up in the loft, but we're not really taught what the liturgy really means. But we need it, and God gave it to us.